The title of today's message is, Does God Like Me? Does God like me? That sounds funny, doesn't it? It looked funny when I was typing it on my computer this week, because everything we've heard and everything we've read is God loves me. God loves me. Jesus loves me. I didn't even go to church growing up. I can't tell you how many times some very well-meaning lady said, Jesus loves you. Usually my mom. But does he like me? And, and don't, let the, don't let my terminology throw you off today because I know in a perfect world we should understand this and the fact that God loves us. He so loves us that he gave his one and only son to die for us that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That love encompasses everything, including the word like. Love is bigger. Love is broader. Love is wi wider. Love goes deeper. Love encompasses all of it. Love is like on steroids. But if you're like me, and sometimes I just pray you're not, we mess this stuff up in our mind and we kind of have figured out a way to separate the two, haven't we? Like, he's my father, my heavenly father, so he has to love me. But does he like me? I never understood the importance of being able to answer that question until about two years ago. I was talking to a counselor about all my dysfunction, talking about all my anxiety. I had taken some time off work because I started having crazy panic attacks and I just couldn't figure it out. And I'm telling him all my issues, and this person left me, and this person left me, and this, this happened, and there was some abuse, and there was this, and, and this person said this, and then there was the social media thing, and the... he said, can I ask you a question? Do you believe God loves you? Without hesitation. I do. I do, and, and I didn't say this, but here's what I was thinking. He kind of has to. He's contractually bound. He put it in the Bible. <laughs> and the Bible says he is love. And he tells me countless times how much he loves me, so I'm thinking, yes, he does. So I had no problem going, yeah, I do. He said, do you think he likes you? I'd never been asked that question. I said, I'm sorry? I don't get it. Does he like you? Do you think God enjoys you? Does he like to be with you? Is he proud of you? Does he want to spend time? And I was shocked at my answer. I was kind of in this no-nonsense mood and kind of just saying everything I thought and no matter what the consequences. And after he asked me the question again, I said, do you want, you want my honest answer? No. I kind of picture God with me like, I love you, you're my son, but my gosh, I started crying when I was talking to him. I said, I feel like God's probably fed up with me. He loves me, but he's got to be close to the end of his rope. Because I just am so aware of all my dysfunction and all my issues and all the temptations. And some days I do well and some days I don't. So I just feel like he'd be more frustrated than like me. You ever felt that? Don't email me. I get it. Love is bigger than like. It's way more important. I'm trying to help us with our broken world mentality brains that starts to separate the two. It's like this. We, we understand it with people, and, and I think that's why sometimes we feel it towards God, even though we probably shouldn't. With people, it goes like this. Um, me, me and my wife will get in a fight, and, you know, she'll apologize, and I'll say, I forgive you, and uh, <laughs> everyone who knows that just went, mm-mm. <laughs> that's not how that goes. We'll be making up, and like uh, recently we were in the car, and it was like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then she said this to me. She goes, do you still love me? And I went, yes, Jill. You know I love you. And then she said this, but do you like me? We kind of separate the two, don't we? We've started to feel it with our kids. Like we blinked, and we just took our first son to college, and it's freaked us out and we've cried a lot. We're so excited for him, but sad for us. 
And all of a sudden, we start thinking about, wait a minute, we're gonna blink, and the other two boys are gonna do the same. We're gonna blink, and none of our kids will live with us anymore, and, and they'll be adults on their own, and maybe families of their own. And, and here's what we thought. Here, we've actually had this conversation. I do believe they'll, they'll, they'll always love us. But will they, will they like us? Will they wanna come back home? Will they wanna come hang out? Will they be proud that we're their parents? Will they enjoy spending time with us? Oh, I know they're gonna love us. I believe they'll always love us. I sure hope they like us. You see, you see how we kind of separate the two? That's what I wanna speak to today. Because we do that with God, and I, I, I think it's tragic. Let me just, I won't even implicate you. I do that with God, and it's caused a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. And so I wanna speak to that today. Deal? Does God like me? Let's go. If you have a Bible, flip open to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm giving you a minute because if you have a paper Bible, you're going to be like, <clears throat> bro, where's 1 Peter? <laughs> Don't laugh, Andrew. You do the same. The Apostle Peter is talking to some friends, some people that he deeply cares about and loves. And he wants them to understand, because they're, they're broken people in a broken world and, and dealing with all kinds of things and persecutions right around the corner. And God's really, he needs, to, he needs to, to lock them in to what he thinks about them. Because what he realizes is, if you don't know what I think about you, if you don't know how I see you from my vantage point, you won't be able to love yourself. You won't be able to like yourself. And if you don't love yourself, it's gonna be real hard for you to let me love you. So you need to know who you are. I want you to know who your identity is now that my son has died on a cross and paid the price for your sins, and now you are a gathering together as, as Christ followers. I need you to know who you now are in Christ. Because when you understand what I think of you, this does God love me and does God like me thing takes care of itself. He says, I want you to understand who you are. He says, this is who you are. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, you're a holy nation, <clears throat> excuse me, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. He said, this is who you are. You've got this idea that I'm too messed up and I'm too broken to connect with God. And it's keeping you from understanding what he thinks about you. It's keeping you at a distance from him. And it's hurting your relationship. So I need you to understand how he defines you. Not how you define you. Not how anybody else has ever defi de defined you in the past. How do you, how does God define you? You need to know how God defines you. You're chosen. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're God's special possession. And you got a calling on your life to go change the world. This is how he sees you. The Apostle Peter is saying, I, I need to get you there. And so there's a few phrases or words in that, in, in that description that I don't know about you, but the first time I read it, it I was like, all right, I'm a royal priesthood. <laughs> I don't know what to do that on Wednesday afternoon, but I'm a royal priesthood, right? So let's go through these. And for the sake of time, I'm going I'm to move quickly because I really want to get to what I want to share at the end. Um, you're chosen. You just the way you are, with every single one of your faults and all the dysfunctions and all the doubts and all the mistakes, you're chosen. And God wants you to know that today. I picked you. And it's not because of what you've done. It's because of who you are. See, because if we're not careful, what we turn that into is God picked me. Now I better start performing. I got to be good enough, right? Right? I gotta figure out how to work hard enough for God to want to choose me. And it, it, I think it's because of just life sort of teaches us that, right? We start to learn this stuff at a young age. We, 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 we go off to school, and, and, and for the first time in our lives, for some of us, we go, I want him to pick me. I want him to pick me on the playground. I, I want him to pick me to be their friend. I want them to pick me to be in their group, right? And, 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 we, and we keep... We keep that mentality as we grow up. I'm gonna work real hard so they'll pick me for the job, so they'll pick me for the promotion, so they'll pick me for their friendship circle, so they'll pick me for that group. So, and, and, then we, and then we transition that over to God, and, and I'm gonna work real hard, and I'm gonna try real hard, and I'm gonna do good enough, and I'm gonna avoid bad enough that I'll be worth something, 
and God will want to pick me. And, and, and the apostle Peter starts off by saying, God wants you to know you don't have to perform. You've already been picked. Listen, one person started to clap. I feel you. It wasn't that good. We'll clap later. Fine. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 4. Listen, this, this, this helps us wrap our minds around this. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. I, have, I take so much pleasure in you, God says. I chose to choose you long before you were ever even born, before you ever had the chance to do anything good. I chose you before you could perform, so why are you now trying to perform so I'll keep choosing you? You don't have to perform anymore. You're already picked. He chose you, and he chose me because of who we are, not because of what we do. Amen? He says, you're a royal priesthood. He says, I didn't just choose you. I actually made a way to be with you because I want to be with you. I enjoy you that much. I sacrificed that much. I want to be with you. See, the people listening, what they would have understood that we need to understand is they're just coming out of generations and generations and generations of a sacrificial system where the only way you can get to God is to go through a priest. I'm too messed up for God. I'm too broken for God. So I'll bring my sacrifice to the temple and I'll give it to a priest and they'll go to God on my behalf. And one time a year, the high priest he gets to go into the inner room of the temple, the holy of holies, and he'll do some sacrificial work to atone for the sins of the entire nation. One time a year, only one guy gets to do that. None of us could ever hope to be like that with God because we're, so, we're far too sinful. We're far too imperfect. He's a perfect God, can't coexist with imperfect people. I'm messed up. I need a priest to go to God on my behalf. The apostle Peter's telling him, I know that's what you're used to. That's not the case anymore. This Jesus that we're celebrating, he just changed all that. And if, if you read your Bible, it talks about how when Jesus was on the cross and he's being crucified, and, and as soon as it's over, and as soon as they're about, to, they're, they're about to realize that he's now passed away and they're gonna take him down and go put him in a tomb, that, that something crazy happens that was unexplainable apart from God doing a miracle is this gigantic, thick, huge curtain that separated the Holy of Holies inside the temple from the rest of the world. It ripped in half from the top to the bottom. It's as if God leaned out of heaven and went, that doesn't need to happen anymore. Now you're my children. Come on in. The Holy of Holies is accessible for you just the way you are. Because Jesus paid for your sins, all you have to do is receive that salvation. Say, I want you, Jesus. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. I'm not going to be perfect, but let's go. And you are forgiven, and his spirit begins to live inside you, and you get heaven forever. And a whole relationship things hap happens with God that couldn't happen before. And he went through all that work because he doesn't just choose you. He wants to be with you and commission you to go change the world. And so he says, you can't look at the priests as the only people who get to do that anymore. That's who you are. You are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. See, again, we read that and go, all right. <laughs> right? We've got to try to get ourselves into their world. And what would the original recipients of this have understood? We want to understand what they would have understood and then apply that to our lives today. Because you're a holy nation. See, here, here's, what, here's what they knew. That for generations and generations and generations and generations, Jewish people pursuing God, they called themselves the holy nation. Israel was the holy nation. And the apostle Peter is trying to remind them that you don't have to just be a part of Israel for this to apply to you. This now applies to everybody. If you're reading this and you're not from Israel, this still applies to you. Now you're a holy nation. What I've done doesn't just apply to them. It also applies to you. He's telling them this stuff is for everybody. Don't you dare disqualify yourself from what I've done. Romans 3.29, is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. This is what the Apostle Peter is talking about. 
Don't get caught up in this old mindset that this is only for certain people because if it's only for certain people who do certain things and act certain ways, at some point, I will, I will be disqualified from that because I'm just not good enough. He says, no, 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 no. Now you're a holy nation. And I'm not talking about where you're from. I'm talking about who you are. You're a child of God. You're chosen. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're perfect in his sight. When you confess your sins, he's faithful. Excuse me, faithful and just to forgive you of our, forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And you're now perfect in his sight. No matter where your birthplace is, no matter who your parents are, no matter what you've been through, you now are a holy nation. That's how your God sees you. That's how he defines you. See, the problem for us is, is we do this, and, and I know we do it, man, because it's just, it, it happens. We, we're broken. We live in a broken world. We rub up next to, and we do life with broken people, and hurtful things happen. Things like people say things to us about your lack of worth or lack of potential or how they feel about you. And you can hear something as a kid. And isn't it true it can stay with you for the rest of your life? We look at our past mistakes and we start to use those things to define us. I'm now a divorced person. I'm now a liar. I'm now a thief. I'm now an addict. I'm now, and we, we look to our past and I'm worthless. Well, how do you know? I've heard it. I felt it. Does that mean it's you? Does that define you? See, we gotta be careful because we'll let these things disqualify us, won't we? God said, no, 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 no. Only I get to define you. Only I get to give you your name. You're my child. My son Ashton was in about fourth grade and we opened up his football bag and he was getting ready to go to his first practice and we had bought all the uniforms and all the stuff because somehow they need to buy brand new uniforms every single year. It's a racket. <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> Brings out the uniform, puts on the shirt, looks good, puts on the pants, puts on the pads, shoulder pads, undershirt, shoulder pads, jersey, boom, boom, turns around. I'm like, what? the wrong name on the back of the jersey. It was like Hoffner. <laughs> He's like, it's fine, Dad. I'm just... No, 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 it's not fine. <laughs> I made such a big deal of this that I just reminded him of, of this this week, and he's like, yeah, I remember. You texted a picture to our coach. I'm like, you're darn right I texted a picture to your coach because nobody gets to name you but me. <laughs> nobody decides to name on your jersey but me. I'm your father. You got that name from me. I don't care what anybody else thinks you ought to be called. I'm telling you what you're going to be called, and I'm the only one who gets to make that decision. Unless Jill says, I can't. <laughs> That's what God's saying. I don't care what you've been through. I care, but it doesn't define you. What you've been through doesn't define you. What you've done in the past doesn't define you. What somebody's done to you in the past doesn't define you. Mistakes that you've made, regrets that you've had, don't define you. What somebody's called you or said about you doesn't define you. I'm your father, only I get to define you, and I get to put the name on that jersey. And here's the name he puts on the jersey. Go ahead and put up those uh, six verses if you would. Let's read that first one in the upper left-hand corner. While I read it, get your phones out or on your device at home, take a screenshot. You guys know I love to do this. Take a screenshot. I want you taking these home with you. Put them up somewhere where you can see them. See which one resonates with you most. It'll probably depend. Every one of us is different, and we have different struggles when it comes to this what does God really think about me thing, but I want you to start accepting the truth, whether you feel it or not, no matter where you come from, no matter what you've been through, you're a holy nation, and only your father gets to put the name on that jersey. And this is the name on the jersey. I am his child, a child of God. That's what defines us. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Okay, I hope you got a screenshot, because we're going to take it down. Would you put that phrase on the lower thirds on the graphic right about there? They get it? Yep. Right there. This is not hopeful, wishful thinking. This is promise from the word of God. His word supersedes 
our emotions. His words supersede anyone else's words. His words supersede my feelings, my thoughts, someone else's opinion. This is the truth of who we are. I'm gonna ask you at every single location to say this with me out loud. We're gonna say it a few times, so it'll take us a second, but we'll get a cadence, and we'll figure this out together. All right, are you ready? I am a child of God. I am loved, valued, accepted, chosen, and called. Now, you got the cadence. I want you to start to take it in. This is who we are according to your creator, no matter what you think about yourself, no matter what anybody else has ever thought about you, no matter what anyone else has ever said about you, this is who you are. Let's say it together. I am a child of God. I am loved, valued, accepted, chosen, and called. That's who you are. I am a child of God. Again, I'm loved, valued, accepted, chosen, and called. Get this in your spirit. It'll start to change your view of yourself, which will allow you to start to accept God's view of you. This is who I am. I might, I've been wearing the wrong name on my jersey for a while, right? Like, we've all got our backstories. And I, I, I grew up with, with, with this feeling of, I'm just not enough. I'm unwanted. I'm not special. I'm kind of a burden. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a complete accident. I mean, I, I carried those names with me. And those were things that defined me. And then at one point in my life, it was, I'm an addict. And that defines me. That's who I am. At one point in my life, it was, I'm suicidal. It's just who I am. No, 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 it's not who I am. It's an emotion that I felt that is a lie from the pit of hell because nobody on this planet will be better off without me. I'm a child of God, and I'm loved, and I'm valued, I'm chosen, I'm called, see. I dealt with this stuff as a pastor. My first, my first pastor job, I just finished an internship, and, and, I, and I went through the, through, through the accreditation process and the schooling and the ceremony, and to my own surprise, I became a real-life pastor. Like, what? And to be honest, I never saw myself doing this. So I was kind of like, well, now what? And so I went to the, the lady who ran the intern program, and, and I said, what am I supposed to do now? I, I'm a pastor. I don't want to talk about God. Like, I'm too nervous to speak in front of people. I don't know enough yet. And she's like, I'll tell you what, we're going to hire you on as one of the youth pastors here. They had a pretty big youth group, and they had like five or six youth pastors. She's like, you can just kind of hide in there. <laughs> that was honestly the plan. Just, you know, be quiet. <laughs> but welcome to the team. <laughs> they were going to give me an office, and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, there's going to be a sign on that door. It was one of the churches with all the names and the signs and the things and the titles. There's going to be a sign that says, Pastor Sean Johnson. <laughs> on the door. I might just stand next to it from time to time. Just, hey, what's up? Just, just by my office. Because I have an office. I'm important, guys. That, those are the stuff I'm feeling. Well, then I realized, okay, what they gave me as an office was an old coat closet. True story. I was like, it's fine, it's still an office. I'm still gonna stand by the sign. And I went by the coat closet one day because I was so excited that I was about to get an office and I'm a real pastor and I'm finally gonna be somebody who matters. And, and there were two guys um, who worked on maintenance at the church and they were inside the office and they were taking out the things and they were putting in the trim. And I heard one of them go, they didn't know I was listening. I heard one of them go, hey, this is the wrong trim. And the other one goes, it's just Sean. Does it matter? And then they both started laughing because all they knew of me was intern guy who vacuums floors and sets up retreats and runs lights and runs errands. They didn't mean to hurt me, and, and I really love both of them. What it did is Satan took that phrase that I heard about me, and he reminded me of it nonstop. And I started to carry that around as a title. I don't matter. Who am I kidding? 
I hate saying the word, but I kind of feel like a hypocrite because I'm trying to be godly and I'm trying to talk about God. And now I'm even a pastor, but look how jacked up I still am. I really don't matter. And I carried that around. It took a long time for me to actually let God go. You know what? Regardless of what anyone else has ever said about you, that is not who you are. You are called, you are chosen, you are a royal priesthood, you are a holy nation, and I don't care what anyone says about you, you're my child, and you're loved, and you're valued, and you're called, and you're chosen, and you're welcome, and you're accepted, let's go. We gotta start to get this inside of us, you see what I'm saying? Band, you can, you can come back up. The fourth one was special possession. I was talking with our local theologian, Ryan Weckenman, from the Austin, Texas team. And we were talking about this, and I was like, man, I'm having a hard time with this part. Like, I'm God's special possession. I don't. And he goes, well, he goes, do you have anything in your house that's like, like really special to you? Like, like a prized possession, like an antique thing. And I'm like, no, <laughs> nothing. He goes, all right, all right. He goes, um, if your house burns down, like, what are you running in there to save? And I went, am I bad for saying shoes? <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, no, you know what? I go, I do have one thing that's kind of cool. I never think about it, but it is kind of cool. On our 15-year anniversary as a church, as some of you might have been here, the leadership team gave me, a, in a glass case, an autographed Kobe Bryant basketball, because they know I've been a Lakers fan forever. And none of us knew it at the time that less than three weeks later, he would die in a tragic accident. And, and I told Ryan, I said, I don't know what they spent on that ball, but man, it's worth a lot more now, like crazy amount probably. I'm like, but I don't know that I'd run and do a fire to save it. I thought about it for a second and I go, Ryan, I'll be honest with you. If me and Jill pull up to our house and see it on fire, we probably start going, praise God. <laughs> we can start over. <laughs> I said, no, the truth is, if, if me and Jill pull up to our house and see it on fire, there's only three reasons I run inside that place and risk my life. And the reasons are Ethan, Austin, and Ashton. I'll risk my life for them without blinking. If I thought I could run in there and give my life and save theirs, I would do it in a heartbeat. He goes, Sean, that's it. That's exactly what God did for you. His son died so you could have his spirit in the here and now and go to heaven forever because that's how much he wants to be with you. That's how much he enjoys you. He's given everything. So when you hear, I love you, don't you dare think, I, but do I like you? You're chosen, not because of what you do, because you're my child, and you're a royal priest. You come to me anytime, and I got a calling on your life. You're a holy nation. I don't care what's happened to you in the past. I'm not concerned with what you've been through. I'm not concerned with anyone else's opinions. The truth is, I think God would say to us today, I'm not concerned with your own opinion about yourself. You're a holy nation. You're my child. You're called and valued and accepted and loved. And I choose you every day. I choose you on your worst day. And you're my special possession. I want to be with you. I enjoy being with you. I like you so much. I gave everything. So do I love you? Oh, you better believe it. And do I like you? I don't know how else to tell you, son. I don't know how else to tell you, daughter. Get those lies out of your head. I love you more than you can fathom. So yes, I absolutely like you. I want to be with you. I want to hang out. Is that starting to get in your soul today? So two years ago, this is what my counselor was trying to help me with. He said, let me read you a couple verses. I want you to get what God's saying. I want you to take away the spirit of what God's saying. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take, listen, great delight 
That's I like you language, isn't it? I enjoy you language. He'll take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. You've got a father, a heavenly father, who looks at your life on your worst day and goes, look at my son, look at my daughter. I just want to sing, I'm so happy. You feel that in your soul. Isaiah 62, two through five, he uses this analogy of a city and a wedding to try to give us the spirit of how God feels. You get a brand new name, straight from the mouth of God. You'll be a stunning crown in the palm of God's hand, a jeweled gold cup held high in the hand of your God. See him bragging? Look at this, look at this, my prized possession, it's my son. My prized possession, it's my daughter. Look how proud I am. Look how in awe I am. Look how much I love him. Look how much I dote on him. Look how much I wanna be with him. No more will anyone call you rejected. And your country will no more be called ruined. You'll be called Hephzibah, my delight. And your land, Beulah, married. Because God delights in you, and your land will be like a wedding celebration. For as a young man marries his virgin bride, so your builder marries you. And as a bridegroom is happy in his bride, so your God is happy with you. Somebody say amen. This is how our God feels. Let it go from here to here, because we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna continue this theme of what an amazing father we have and how much he loves us. And yes, he absolutely likes and wants to be with us. We're going to continue this into worship. And my prayer for you today is that you would just sense this, this unbelievable presence of God, that you would start to feel some weights come off your shoulders, that you would start to release some of the lies you've been holding on to for too long and start to realize, I'm not what somebody else says I am. I'm not what I've thought about myself. I'm not the mistakes I've made. I am who God says I am. I am his child, and I'm gonna step into his presence with confidence. That's what I want for, I want for you today. And listen, if you're watching this on YouTube, on any other platform, in one of our buildings, on a bike, a hike, a trail, a gym, an office, a dorm room. And you've, you've been hearing me talk about everything that God has done through his son Jesus to make this relationship possible. And, and something in your heart is like jumping, going, I need that. That's, that's the God of the universe using this moment to get your attention. He doesn't want you to miss out on any of what we just talked about. And so he says, I give you my son. He died to pay the price for your sins. All you have to do is accept this free gift. The Bible says anyone. It doesn't matter what's been going on. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter. You're a holy nation. It doesn't matter. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That can be you today. Don't miss this moment. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that you're speaking. I thank you that you're speaking to our souls today, not just our intellect, but our souls. I want to ask two questions, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to believe for some, some miraculous things to happen. The first one is this. You already have a relationship with God. But as I've been talking, you realize I've been defining myself by the wrong things. And I really struggle with feeling like I'm enough for God. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? We're going to pray for some freedom today. We're going to pray for some chains to come off today. I get it. It's me often. The second question is this. You don't have a relationship with God, not yet, but you know it, like in your heart you know it. God's calling me into a relationship with him. Today I can feel it, and I'm not gonna be perfect, and I don't know how this is gonna turn out, but today I wanna ask God to forgive me of my sins. I wanna make him my Lord. I just choose to follow him because I want his spirit to live within me like the Bible promises. I want heaven forever. I wanna be with him forever like the Bible promises, and if he wants me, then today I say yes. If that's you, raise your hand at all locations. Raise him no matter where you're at, no matter what platform you're watching on. I say yes to Jesus today. I want him. Come on, church. Lives are changing literally around the world today. God, I thank you for the life change that's happening in our souls, in our eternities right now. I thank you that you brought us here together as a family 
for one simple reason, to remind us how much you love us, that you like us, that you wanna be with us, that you chose us, that we are called, that we are enough, and we can rest in that. And I pray, God, some supernatural peace and rest starts to just flood our souls right now. I'm chosen by God. I don't have to listen to the lies. I'm chosen by God. He wants me, I don't have to perform. He wants me. Oh God, I pray for peace in that realization today. And I thank you for the eternal lives that are being changed literally around the world today, God. We love you, we thank you. It's our honor as a church family to worship you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. let's worship. <laughs>